Hello. Can you hear me? Is that good? Water is totally not open, but I'll wing it here. OK. This is always the hardest part. How are we doing today? Everyone good? Good day? OK. Um, I'm going to be a buzzkill. Um, we're going to talk about the impossible job. The impossible job is leadership. It's really hard. I'll explain why. Um, before I do that, I have a couple questions for y'all. How many of you are project managers? <laughs> Knew that was coming. OK, fine. How many of you are not project managers? OK. How many uh, lawyers are here? <laughs> OK, good, sweet, awesome. How many of you are managing other humans right now? You have a team. Oh, everybody. OK, cool. How many of you managing managers? OK. And how many of you are leaders? Everyone's hand goes up. <laughs> everybody, hand go up. You're all leaders. This is going to be what we're going to be talking about today. Whether you're a manager, whether you're a product manager, whether you're a program manager, whether you're a design manager, whether you're IT, whether you're HR, whether, whatever you do, you're doing some form of leadership. I'm going to talk about why that's impossible. Um, my name is Rands. I play this guy on the internet named Rands. It's my wife's maiden name. I'm the guy who sounds like a fortune cookie. I've, as already mentioned, I've written a couple books, Managing Humans, which is the third edition. And I've also written a book called Being Geek, which is sort of a, a software developer's career guide. I've had a lot of jobs. I always put this slide in at the beginning to kind of show, hey, this is the places I've worked. I worked at that creepy place called Palantir. I worked at Pinterest, which is like a study in contrast after Palantir. And now I'm currently the VP of engineering at Slack. But I put this up here, and I think about it. And I think about sort of how I became a leader. And you have to actually go look at sort of the complete corpus of work that I've done. And it's quite a bit. Borland, anyone here? Borland? Like four. It's like we're getting smaller and smaller every year. It's going to be like one guy and me. Hi. Netscape, that startup you've never heard of. I was at Apple. I was at the other companies as well. Let me tell you how I became a leader. I was working at Netscape. And um, Tony, my boss, said, hey, can you look after Harrison and Frank? And I'm like, sure. What, what does that mean? He's like, yeah, let's not set up one-on-ones, see what's going on there. I'm like, sure, OK, I set up one-on-ones. Harrison, how are you doing? Frank, what's going on? And I did this for a while, and we got busier because the company was growing, and lots of things were happening. We were inventing the internet, which was kind of fun. And then finally, I go up to Tony. I'm like, hey, Tony, like, we're super busy. There's so much to do. We're like doing a web-based bug tracking system, which was like the first one in the world. And we're busy. And like, can we get another person? He's like, yeah. Lop, friends, whatever your name is, go create a wreck. I'm like, a wreck? What's a wreck? <laughs> what does that mean? He's like, go hire another person. I'm like, I can do that? This is how I became a leader. I didn't even know what was going on. And that was the beginning of this long path of learning about leadership. And I've done a lot of talks. I've done a lot of talks about what does it all mean and all these big, huge talks about leadership. True story, true story. Last time I was in this building, I gave a talk with, with Mary, and uh, that was the day the, um, the uh, prime minister resigned. <laughs> That was a pretty quiet crowd. I did that talk, same talk, um, I think four or five months later, whenever it was, the uh, day of the US election. <laughs> yeah, so we're not doing that talk today. <laughs> we're not going to do that talk. This talk is about simplification. It's about the simple things around leadership that I've learned during all of these jobs. We're going to be talking about hacks. We're talking about leadership hacks. What is a hack? A hack, this is a term that comes out of MIT, it's a university in Boston, and a hacker is someone who does interesting creative work at high intensity levels, supplies to anything from writing computer programs to pulling a clever prank that amuses and delights everyone on campus. For example, they built a one-third scale lunar lander on top of the Great Dome there. This was a hack. These are not the kind of hacks we're talking about, but it's, they're, they're, they're genetically related. The hacks that I want to talk about today is via my career of doing this for about three decades. I want to condense small pieces of wisdom that they, they, they pay unexpected high return on time invested. 
they feel like cheating. Like you do this, you're like, really? This thing happens when I do this? That's amazing. You're going to need them because this job is impossible. This job is impossible. A couple disclaimers. I have two disclaimers. My situation is I'm currently the VP of engineering at Slack. I have about 286 engineers that I work with. Um, I have managers, I have directors, I have managers. Some of these are based on that situation. Some of them may not feel familiar to me, you. Another disclaimer, they're kind of therapy for me. These hacks, these things which are incredibly useful to me may not apply to you. You may automatically do these things in your, instinctively. So I'm not expecting you to look at each of these and go, you just blew my mind, Rans. This is amazing. Thank you so much. They are, these hacks both accentuate strengths and they help some of my weaknesses. Because <sighs> this job is impossible. Leadership is super hard. It's incredibly hard. It's incredibly taxing. I used to have hair. <laughs> it was kind of cool. Why is it so hard? I will tell you why it's hard. There's never enough time. You are greatly outnumbered by chaotic, beautiful snowflakes. There is too much to do, and there is too much to know, and their expectations of you are unattainable. Rough gig. This is a rough gig. Project managers, it's even harder. They have to listen to me. I sign the paychecks. I'm the one who decides perform about performance plans. You're in a role, very often, purely of influence. You don't have that leverage of being the manager. This is an impossible job. Why would everyone want to do this? <laughs> Let me give you some hacks that are going to make this impossible job a little bit easier. There is never enough time. As a leader, part of the gig, I got to get some water, is that you are exposed to more things. You're in meetings where you try to open up water bottles. <laughs> It's a function of leadership. I'm not going to pour this on the computer. It's a function of leadership that you're exposed to more information. You're in the meetings. You're in the right Slack channels. You're, having the, you're, talk, you're wandering around. You're talking with people. You're aggregating data. Chances are things are rolling up to you. You're being exposed to more things. There's never enough time to deal with all of the things, with all of these beautiful chaotic snowflakes. So let's talk about the hacks. I want to reset your expectation one more time. These are not world changing. Your job is going to be different. These are hacks. These are small bits of wisdom. At Apple, there's this thing. It's called Apple Standard Time. <laughs> How many of you already know what I mean? What time is the meeting? The meeting's at 2 o'clock. OK, so at 2 o'clock, <clears throat> you arrive in the meeting. It's with seven other people, and it's you and two other people. And it's supposed to be seven. It's cool, it's Apple, it's Apple standard time, which means that it's okay that ever the meeting basically starts at 2.05, which means we're paying five minutes for about six people to read Twitter. This is not a great investment of our human beings. How in the world did that happen? How did, that, how did Apple standard time, it's actually about seven minutes or so, I don't know, I'll tell you how it happened. Years and years and years ago, so Apple was 100, 200 people, maybe it was Steve, or maybe it was someone, but someone important said, they didn't say anything, they just showed up two minutes late. And it was the VP of the so-and-so. And everyone went, okay, two minutes late, that's fine. So it's okay to be two minutes late. And two minutes became three minutes, between five minutes became seven minutes. Every meeting at Apple, as long as I was there, was okay with starting seven minutes late. Apple standard time. As a leader, you're setting the tone and the culture with every single move. I show up two minutes early for everything. I show up in the meeting. I'm standing outside the door. Now, it's hard because I usually have a meeting right before that, which means I have to go and leave that meeting three minutes or four minutes or however long so you get from point A to point B. 
this is, I'm setting the tone because at Slack, I don't want it to be Apple standard time. I want to know, I want everyone to know that we respect the time of the humans that we're working with and we start on time. And when I got there, they were about a minute or two late on everything and it was fine, it was fine. We Slack standard time, two minutes. My meetings start right on time. They start right on time. And when you walk in a minute later, there's no problem with that, but you know you're late because we're already talking. We're already working on the things. And by the way, you're not late the next time either. This is just a small little hack, two minutes early. My challenge to you is this. If you can't do this, if there's something about your culture or your team or your company or your group where they can't do this, there's something off. There's something wrong that you can't actually shape the timing culture to be able to allow yourself to do this. I um, was at Pinterest beforehand. And I got there and I'm like, hello, I'm Rand, Slop, whatever my name is. And I want to meet all of you. So I set up one-on-ones with every single person in engineering. Seemed like a really good networking move, right? There's 170 of them. <laughs> my admin's like, got, we got there like 30 or 40 of them. And she's like, you're going to be done in like five months. Are you cool with that? And I'm like, no, this is a super bad idea. <laughs> so I scheduled like one to many, and it wasn't working out. The fact of the matter is, as a leader, there is more of them than you. It is not effective to meet them all, but you must be available. You must cultivate the sense of availability, because you're a leader. They want to understand what's going on. They want to understand what you think about. So what I did, and I did this at Slack as soon as I arrived, I got there and I'm like, I want to meet all of you. So every two weeks, for two hours, I have office hours. If any of you would like to come, please sign up. And first week, like no one did, and I kept on saying it, kept on saying it, and now they're full for the next three months. And what I've done is for the folks that really do want to reach out, that really want to talk to me, I'm available. I'm available to actually talk about whatever they want to talk about. These are, other than my one-on-ones, these are the most valuable meetings I have. Because I, I, Slack's about 800 or so folks right now, there's lots of things going on. We're going like crazy. And it's an early warning system about all sorts of different things. It encourages a serendipity, this random connection inside of the company. Office hours. Two hours, every two weeks. Hacks, small things. So, we're having a one-on-one. -on -one. You and I are talking to each other. You're right there. And we're sitting here and I'm having a conversation. You're asking me questions and we're like really in it because you're like, oh, you're totally fucking up the architecture. I'm like, I'm sorry about that, I didn't mean to. And you're like, here's why it's a problem. And then I go and I do this. And I look over at the clock. What did I do there? I devalued the moment. We were having this incredible conversation about the state of the architecture to check the time. And by the way, I wasn't doing anything nefarious. I wasn't doing anything mean. I was just trying to stay on time because I want to be two minutes late. I want to be two minutes early. But there's this thing about this connection that we have in this one-on-one. -on -one. Empathy is a superpower. I'm listening and I want to respect the time that we have here because there's more of you than me. So what do I do whenever I walk into a meeting room two minutes early? Find the clock, and I turn it towards me. Why? Because I want to have this conversation, and I want to be talking to you, and I want to glance, and I want you to know that I'm not listening. I want you to know that I care, and I value your time. Another pro tip, wear a watch. <laughs> I don't like wearing watches. Move the clock towards you. This job is so hard because of these chaotic, beautiful snowflakes. So all of these diverse set of human beings that are swirling around you with their needs and wants. Some of them are familiar, some of them are not. And you're outnumbered. It's exhausting. I will die someday. And they will probably do a gravestone. And it'll say, lop, rands, whatever. And it'll say, do your one-on-ones. <laughs> this is like my thing. One-on-ones are my thing. This is the most important meeting of the week with your staff, the direct reports and the people around you in your ecosystem. 30 minutes every week, no matter what. 30 minutes every week, no matter what. And I tend to do them early in the week because they set the stage 
for what's going to happen that week. So all of my meetings, Monday is a meeting path day, executive staff, one-on-ones. I'm learning everything that's going to matter this week. This is something I learned at Apple. All of the stuff to set the context for the week happens on Monday. And as much as possible, I do my one-on-ones there. Every week, 30 minutes, no matter what. Have you had your boss, your leader, reschedule a one-on-one one -on -one with you before? The answer is yes. And he or she did one of two things. They said something about it, or they didn't say anything at all. If they didn't say anything at all, my question to you is, how'd you feel? Meaning just got randomly moved, no context, how'd you feel? I'll tell you how I feel. I feel like I'm not important. I feel like this person who is responsible for me, my growth, for my thriving, for what I'm doing, doesn't, can't care enough to tell me why we've moved that meeting. So if you have to reschedule a one-on-one, -on -one, tell them why. I'm in London next week. I would love to catch up. I'm happy to catch up on my video conference. Everyone hears about, as my schedule is changing, why I'm rescheduling things. Again, recurring theme, valuing their time. They know your name. Why don't you know theirs? All of the people around, it's such a small little hack. I do this thing whenever I started a company. I, write, I figure out whatever the, you know, the directory of people is, and I write some PHA script, pull down all the pictures, and then give myself flashcards so I can learn everyone's name. So when I'm walking around, I'm saying, hey, Mary, how's it going today? It's a small little thing that as a leader, that you're acknowledging we have this connection that this matters that we're a team, that we're familiar with each other. Maybe it's not incredible familiarity, but there's some familiarity that, we can, we, that you know this person's name. Using it. When I'm sitting in a one-on-one -on -one in one of these office hours with people that I may not see once for every three months, I'm using their name. I'm repeating. I'm saying, hey, Mary, how's it going today? What's telling you? That was really interesting, this thing you said. It's, it sounds like a trick. It's not a trick. It's the, it's the presentation of yourself that you're giving to the rest of your team. Back at Pinterest, we, um, the exec team, we'd have a slide deck, and we'd all get together, a lot of firepower, and we'd spend the first few minute, 15 minutes of the meeting reading the slide deck together, which is fine. You know, we're all busy people, but this seemed like an intense waste of our time because we couldn't prepare before a meeting a bunch of execs to actually spend the time to go and read the slide deck. Any meeting that I'm walking into, I'm going to prepare either the night before or have time before it. And the one I prepare for when I go in with a one-on-one -on -one or into these office hours, I just do a little bit of research. It takes, takes a couple of minutes. And I find three questions. Because very often people come into one-on-ones and they think it's like a status report. Like, I did these seven things, I didn't do these three, and these are the two that are remaining. I have JIRA. I know how it's going. There's a million tools, including Slack, which will tell me the state of what's going on. One-on-ones, staff meetings, are for topics of substance. Things we're gonna talk about that are not status. Status doesn't happen in these meetings. And if someone, especially new engineering managers, come in, they have all the status things they wanna talk about, I always have three questions. Hey, last time we talked about you being conflict adverse. Like you are like walk away when someone is kind of like getting that and you're like, that's something that we decided mutually we're gonna work on. What's something you've done recently to work on that? Let's have a conversation about that. I always walk into any meeting with three questions. I've done my homework, so when if it's a if it's a lull, if we're not jumping right into it, I have something to calm and shape the conversation. Again, this is one of the reasons that one-on-ones for me are so high signal, is we're not talking about status. We're talking about the things that matter to the humans on the team. And again, valuing their time. Okay. <laughs> this is my favorite part of the slides. <clears throat> Rainbows and unicorns. Uh, what? Rainbows and unicorns? What are you talking about? How many of you have played a game called Peggle? Anyone? All right, the six of you are gonna know about what's gonna happen. You play Peggle, and when you get to this win state, this is the screen that you get, and this is, there's gonna be some sound here. Okay, so you like playing this thing and you get the balls, it's kind of like pachinko, right? It drops down, you actually gotta go do this thing. 
And when you win, this is what happens. A really good friend who told me at the time, she said, um, it is the most consistent and unadulterated source of positive feedback you'll ever get in your life. <laughs> in this explosion of rainbows and fireworks and Beethoven's Ode to Joy, it's like this, it's totally designed and just watching you, right? You're, this is positive, you didn't even win. It's, just this, it's the playing of the winning thing. You didn't even win and you're giggling and laughing about it. What is this? What is this game capturing? What this game is capturing are compliments. The game, unicorn, the head being a unicorn, was like, good job, you. You totally did amazing. And the music and the rainbows, it's completely over the top. But you're happy. Compliments are free leadership points. They are amazing. It doesn't mean you just throw them around whenever you want, but there's this moment that you can sit in this meeting where it's tense, and you can say, Rochelle, <laughs> you did amazing work on this because of this, because of this, and that. I am astounded by this work. And what became this incredibly tense thing was suddenly this acknowledgement, we're all working hard, let's just chill out a second, and let's talk about the things that we're doing well. I don't know what it's like in London, but Silicon Valley, a lot of companies, pretty cutthroat. This compliment thing, again, compliments of substance, not saccharine throwaway things, things where you recognize the value of what other humans are doing. This is amazing. This is something that I try to think every time it's getting strange or like, or when I just see something where I'm like, that's, that's just truly amazing, that work that you did. Acknowledging that, passing that back. Free leadership points. Trust, what you're looking for in a really good manager, employee, or employee situation is you're looking for trust. People want to feel trusted. Get that with respect. Compliments are one way, are one way, one small transaction to start to build that respect and build that rapport. Whew. Still an impossible job. There's still too much to do, and there's far too much to know. I get in this mood about every three months or so, where I'm, whether it's at work or whether it's at home, where I say, OK, what I'm going to do for the next hour is I'm going to fix every small thing that's in front of me immediately. I'm going to fix it. Let's do it at home. So I get out of bed. And I, next to my bed is a bed stand, and there's a stack of books about this high, the books that I'm never going to read, that have been sitting there for four months. So I go through the list, take it down to two books, put the rest somewhere else where they'll never be read. It took me 45 seconds. And then I go, and I try to do 20 of those things in a row. I don't usually get to 20, because I usually get distracted around 14. But <laughs> what I'm doing is I'm just paying down a little bit of debt in my house. Just like, okay, let's put that away. And the thing about this is it feels, it feels great, by the way, when you get to 14 or 15. I get to 20 occasionally. But what you're doing here is you're understanding the value of fixing small things. Doing this at work, because we're like thinking a big strategy and vision and all these things, there's days at work while I'm doing is tidying the house. Because I think in general that we underestimate the compounding awesomeness of continually fixing small, broken things. <clears throat> been, the way I've been thinking about this is I'm worrying about quality in Slack right now. I'm worrying about, like, what's, what's our quality strategy? What are the three things I can say that are actually going to really change sort of the, the course of the mindset of the engineering team around quality? And I realize, just on this trip right now, it's just, you know, we have Jira, and we should use it. Every time that I see a problem inside of the product, I will write a Jira. I'll put it in there, and I'll make sure that the people who get it I'll know that I'm paying attention, filing bugs, noting them. These little small things. And what I've noticed 
what I've noticed when I fix these small things is I don't have to worry about them anymore. Those books, that one bug in Slack, all these things, just small little things. And people notice it as well. They see that you're actually going and fixing things. What Stuart Butterfield says, he's the CEO of Slack, is put away your dishes, right? You eat, put them, put them away. Fix small things. This is another one related to meetings. Think about this for yourself. What are the three most important numbers in your business? I'm not sure what they are. ARR, average, re average revenue, retention, departures, acceptance rate, decline rate, attrition rates. I'm not sure what those numbers are. What I find is in any company, in any team, there's about three to five numbers that really, really matter. And the more that I'm sitting on top of those numbers and I'm instinctively always knowing what those numbers are, the happier the rest of my team is. What are the three to five most important numbers to your business and do you know where they're coming from and how they're actually and why they matter? Intimately and instinctively. As I've been saying a couple of times, we as leaders tend to have more context. We tend to see more of the business because we're in the meetings and we're running around doing all these things. We was, uh, when I was at Pinterest, the, um, the CEO, we took meeting notes in the exec staff meeting. So most meetings, someone's taking notes and kind of capturing what happens. And then what he does is he sends it out to exec staff. And one time, he sent it to the entire company. <laughs> Fortunately, there was, he was like, just email, mailing list error, right? Fortunately, um, there wasn't anything in there that was super confidential, which was lucky. But the more interesting thing was everyone was like, this is great. This is amazing. Like, now we know what the execs are doing all day, right? <laughs> And what we did at that point forward for that meeting, all staff meetings, is they're just shared. When we redact personal things or things which are confidential or private, but we share all of that information. This is another thing that we do at Slack, which is we have channels for all the meetings where all of the meeting notes go. It's, I think there's this leadership tendency to kind of cherish the things that you know. They make you powerful if you know this thing and like, and that's, that's, that's a super bad idea, number one. And the thing about a great idea or a great piece of information is the more that you get it out with more people, the more eyeballs see it and the better the idea gets. As leaders, part of your job is to share profusely. All of this context, content, people, situations that you're running into need to be broadcasted everywhere all the time, albeit not the confidential stuff. This is the hard one. I've been working on this one for a while. I, I'm not sure if this is true, but I'm gonna try it out on you. The thing is, people that have leaders, people that they respect, their expectation, and this is unfair, is that you are the best version of them. Think about that. It's kind of, it's kind of a puzzler. They want you to be everything that they are as their best perfect self. And the problem is, you're just you. But there's a bar here that you want to maintain. As a leader, and when I get to the slide, I start getting super aware of how I'm speaking. <laughs> Every word is judged. Everything that you say is judged as a leader. You need to know what you're saying before you open your mouth. Most of the big mistakes I've made in my life are free reeling yellow things I said on stage that kind of went sideways because I wasn't actually thinking about what I was saying. Speak clearly, speak slowly. Every word will be judged. One of the best classes I sign new engineering managers up and DM or mail me, I'll send it out or I'll send it out to the channel is a speaker training class. This will blow your mind if you haven't had speaker training before. It'll blow your mind how many odd things you do as a person who is speaking in front of people. Get some speaker training. If you're a leader, if you're talking to folks, this is a craft that you want to get really, really good at. And I'll share one that I like a lot in channel. This is one of my go-to um, questions for senior leaders. 
And it's not novel, you've probably heard of it before, but it's something that is a really important hack, which is can you admit failure and explain what happened? How did it fail? And I should have a great story here, but I've never failed, I have failed. Um, <laughs> it's this thing we all have. I probably failed today in a couple of ways. But the question is, are you cognizant of what the failure is? Can you explain it? I'm sorry, I screwed this up. I, uh, I sent out this mail about diversity and I didn't give context to the numbers. So you can just tell your own story from it. And I should have given some insight into these numbers. So I'm sorry. I understand that without that context that people would have derived X, Y, Z, blah, 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 blah. Can you explain it? Can you admit it? And most importantly, can you convey the wisdom that you learn from the failure? This is, again, one of my go-to management questions because when people don't have like that failure in mind, there's something, and I, it, there's something that I don't trust about that, that they're not as flawed as I am. <clears throat> The, the social justice aspect of this is just a, a no-brainer. There's actually, it's like that's the go-to reason to have a diverse team. But here's the other thing. Ideas get better with eyeballs. Ideas get better with diverse eyeballs. We as human beings like to hang out with people who look like us and who agree with us. It's just the way it is. It's more comfortable that way. You need, as a leader, you need to push yourself way out of your comfort zone, especially if you're building software for humans, to pull in a diverse set of ideas, a diverse set of perspectives, a diverse set of values. And by the way, this isn't easy at all. These humans are going to say things that you disagree with. These humans are going to challenge you in a way that the hair on your back of your neck is going to stand up because they are different than you. You are different than them. But that's the point. That's the joy, is actually getting that understanding and seeing how you can actually bridge, you can bridge a, a divide between you, a divide in perspective. This is really, 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 really hard. This is a hundred year problem. We've been screwing this up for a long, long time. And we're working really, really hard at Slack on this and we still have a lot more that we need to do. There's a, uh, there's a natural thing, not natural, there's, an unnatural, there's a natural thing which is very not awesome that happens in rapidly growing companies, which is that they become political. It's they become, become political because they get big and get siloed and people start to get their walls up. And at that time, and it's happened in every company that have happened, the way that I know it's getting political is the most bizarre stuff starts showing up on my desk. People are like, so uh, Lop, I heard you were deer hunting this weekend. I'm like, I don't deer hunt, what are you talking about? <laughs> that's, that's bizarre, what, where did you hear that? Oh, someone, someone like, and there's this like little chain of like, I said the word deer and someone overheard me and like it just got through there and like now I'm a deer hunter. I'm like, wow, that's just bizarre that it's there. You need to work as a leader to, at, at Palantir we called rumint, rumor intelligence, crush rumint, crushing rumors. Every staff meeting that I have, I say, save 10 minutes at the end and I say, Okay, let's talk about gossip, rumors, and lies. What do you got? Let's just talk it through. And people are gonna say, well, so were you deer hunting? I'm like, I don't even own a gun. <laughs> I have no, and I love deer too, I wouldn't hunt them. That seems like a really bad idea. <laughs> You're doing this investment in putting truth back into the system. And having this as part of sort of the running dialogue, at times people start to go like, they get, we start needing like more than 10 minutes to actually crush the rumors. It's just something which you're putting signal, you're crushing the rumors and putting signal back into the system. Another controversial one. Has the sky fallen recently? You had one of those days? Is it, is it falling right now? Could be. Um, here's the thing. Part of your job as a leader, and this may be uncomfortable for some of you, is to be smiling while the sky falls. And it's not because you're happy that the sky is falling, it's that as other people are walking around who are fully aware that the sky is falling, they want to understand how we're gonna fix it. What are we gonna do about it? 
And your smile is not going to fix it. Your smile is, in a moment, going to calm them down. Wop seems pretty happy. Isn't the scar falling? <laughs> <laughs> your job is to lead. You walk around the hallway, you walk around the building, and you're setting the tone with your presence. Now, it doesn't mean I'm like smiling all the time. I get angry, I get frustrated. But when it's falling, when people are getting angry with each other, when it's, the sparks are flying, I want to be the person who sits there and be like, well, this is pretty fucked up. It's not as bad as it could be. Let's go figure this out. Smile as the sky falls. Understand that as a leader, you're walking around the building with that look on your face. You are setting the tone in a small way. This is a lot of stuff. We're up to 16 of these right now. The thing I want you to do, leaving, what is it, Friday, going into the weekend, is I just want you to pick one of these things. Maybe it's on here, or maybe you've been inspired by one thing. And I want to tell you what my one thing is. My one thing is this game called Destiny. <laughs> Anyone play Destiny? This is a second video game reference. Oh, really? Pagel is bigger than Destiny? Oh, that's so sad. Um, OK. <laughs> It's OK. You don't have to play Destiny to understand the story. Um, I play this game called Destiny. It's a first-person shooter. And I play with this guy from Portland. His name is DJ. You can play Destiny by yourself, but it's far more fun to play with other human beings. For certain parts of the game, it's called a raid, and you need other humans together on the internet to actually play these games. It requires, more of it, it requires six humans who need to act as a team to defeat the bad guys. And they're all guys, I think, or gals, y'all. <clears throat> there are challenges. There are challenges. You need six people. And the fact of the matter is, the internet is full of colorful people and personalities. <laughs> How are you going to find some folks to do this thing? Raids are complex affairs. Someone needs to lead or everyone dies. It's called a wipe. So someone needs to lead, and it's volunteer leadership. I'm not. I'm not joking. I'm, not, I'm being completely sincere when I say that DJ from Portland is the nicest, calmest, kindest human being that I know. And I've never met him. I've never actually met him. I talk about it. I do the slide. Mary's heard this story like three times now. We've spent hours, hundreds of hours, doing virtual batters, battles against the digital bad guys. And he's unfailingly kind. Need to leave the raid we've been at for two hours because you want to be with your family? DJ says, no worries. We'll find another person. Having repeated difficulty fulfilling your part of the raid, which is re resulting in the team failing, DJ says, no worries. Let me explain how this works. Didn't mention that you didn't ever play this raid before you started? DJ says, no worries. I love teaching. And he does. Want to practice part of the raid you've never done before? No worries. Let's schedule some time to do that. This is a human being who I've never seen angry. Maybe he's a robot. I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> he is unfailingly kind. It's a leadership model that leads, leads itself to volunteer situations. But my question to you, and my one thing, is why not all situations? You're thinking of an important leader. You're thinking of someone out there, some story of a leader who was a dictator who isn't kind. You're thinking of a story you heard about that dictator like firing someone on the spot in the elevator. It's a good story. It's not really good leadership. Being kind means listening, using that superpower of empathy, understanding needs, wants, and desires, and understanding that each of these beautiful, chaotic snowflakes are fundamentally different than you. And there's wonderfulness inside of that difference. You can learn from that difference. Being kind does not mean being nice. I didn't say it was nice. It can be the kind thing to fire someone, believe it or not. And if you want to know about that, we'll talk over beers. This is mine, and it's working for me. It's working for me that everywhere I'm going around, with all the stress of companies growing and people wanting things, this is my default state. How can I help you with that? What, what can I learn from that? Let's figure out how to get this done. Oh, you're super mad. That's a drag. <laughs> I'm in it to win it. Let's figure out what we're going to do. 
when I was, uh, I went to Moo earlier today, Moo.com, Moo and I was talking with Mary about sort of, she'd looked at some research about why people didn't sign up for leadership conferences, and the observation, I'm synthesizing this story, is, was that we didn't want to sign up for a leadership conference because we didn't want to admit that we needed help. Here's the thing. I'm mostly joking about it being impossible. It's totally possible, but it's like any other skill in your life. It's something you need to learn, you need to practice at, you need to curate, and you can get better at it. I've been working on this for 30 years. I'm not remotely done. There was never enough time. Let's, let's frame this from the optimism. Let's put some optimism in this. I'm of the belief you get to do it once, which means that every single minute counts. I am somewhat infamous from walking out of meetings that are useless. I will warn them kindly. I will warn them again, and then I'll walk out. I'll walk out because I have explained as many times as I can what we need to do in this meeting, and every minute that I have is precious. You're greatly, greatly outnumbered by chaotic, beautiful snowflakes. Your diversity is your strength. The diversity of the people around you, the way that you understand a diverse network of humans is a strength. This is how you build great products. This is how the ideas become compelling. There's too much to do and too much to know. This is a totally buried hack, but I'll put it here. The biggest challenge that I see with engineering managers and most new leaders is they're really bad at delegating. And for engineers, the reason is this. When the sky falls, what do we do? We go usually and regress back to the state that is most comfortable. The site's down. I know how to get the site up. I wrote the site, so I'm going to help and put it back up. This is incorrect leadership. This is poor leadership. When the sky falls, good leadership is allowing others to learn how to deal with the situation. It's trusting others, even though they may not know how to do it, to actually do the work. It's the, it's absolute, it's the absolute opposite of leadership when you're going back and not giving others the opportunity, the same, op the same opportunity that you had the last time this guy fall. Delegation, really, really hard. Finally, oops, I said I was gonna do it, I've gotta do this again, ah, drag. And it's the big finish too, get to see these again, and then this one. Their expectations are unattainable. I'm still working on this. There's some poetry here, but I'm not sure how it actually all fits together. But maybe a better way to think about this is that you must consistently raise your bar. I tend to quit my job every three years. And I also tell them this when they hire me. I'm like, you get me for three years and then deuces, I'm out. They can change the job and they can do something. Why am I doing that? I, I, I bore easily? No, I want to keep learning. I want to see what Slack is like. How is it different than Pinterest? How is it like Apple? What happened at Borland? What are the stories I learned from Netscape? Their expectations of you are very high as a leader. Your expectations of yourself should be higher. Thank you.